Hello everyone, today we talk about the invention of cavalry. We have to give that for most of military history, even though, you know, warfare, say, uh, started well in prehistory. But cavalry as an arm didn't quite exist, right? It came about fundamentally just in the last millennia, and today we're going to sketchily explain how. Um, so you have literally to imagine <laughs> at some point, right, somebody uh, inventing properly in, or discovering, if you, if you want, that the horse could be used in combat, right, uh, or by pulling a chariot or also riding it. This is the, you know, that, uh, as we will see now, it's chariot warfare fundamentally that begins uh, properly in military history and in a systematic way. Uh, cavalry, meaning properly, strictly speaking, horse riders were always there and were in another, just they had some uh, supporting roles. And cavalry fundamentally affirmed itself mostly from the Iron Age onward as the main main arm, while essentially uh, chariot warfare was, was, was declining. And we're not much documented on it. It's properly the horse that was the, the, the precious thing in itself and mostly also in some in cultures, uh, early civilizations, properly making an estate asset that was most, in fact, destined originally to to uh, chariots, but that could be used also naturally in, in, in different ways. Um, let's say, in Europe, up to 10,000 BC, circa, it seems that men still not uh, still didn't distinguish the horse from the wild animals, right? That he hunted them and ate them, uh, perhaps even to the point of causing their extinction because the last findings of the remains of slaughtered horses date back to that period, right? Um, in the most populated areas, so uh, it's difficult, as you understand, at uh, that time to, to, to track, you know, some, some reliable evidence to date it correctly and so on, and, but especially to systematically reconstruct um, uh, the, the deal of the time just through it. Um, other horse remains are instead found only around 4000 BC, but this time uh, from properly farmed animals, because at this point, as you know, the man had ceased to be the hunter-gatherer of the Paleolithic and be had become a farmer-breeder of the Neolithic. So this is the moment in which the domestication of the horse proper very gradually, very slowly began. And as you understand, here we're talking fundamentally about sedentary settlements, right? So the situation was different um, elsewhere, more specifically in the Eurasian steppes, right? That, as you know, in the West reach as far as the Danube, the Carpathians, and here the habitat was ideal for wild horses because they they could thrive far beyond the consumption capacities of the very few inhabitants of this huge area mm -hmm. so the the region um, knew both the breeding of horses and their hunting at the same time right albeit still the the function remained that of food consumption Things began just to, clue, just to change there in, in an unprecise time, more or less simultaneously uh, between Central Asia and Ukraine, so where the, the largest steps and also demic concentration in it uh, existed, between 4500-3000 BC. Mm -hmm. And there is a great debate about this between historians, archaeologists, about probably the taming of the horse for riding purposes, right? Here, in fact, we find for the first time horse skulls with molars consumed by a bite, which, by, by, by a break, which is a, an unequivocal sign that the animal was being ridden. Mm -hmm. And this period, as you understand, is very long. So we know actually a very few because these horses might have been simply uh, you know, companions rather than properly uh, fellow, you know, 
warriors, let's say, um, the, uh, the, they could be false captured and then kept with the family without being eaten, as perhaps it had instead happened to their parents. And we can pinpoint archaeologically some, some areas, and specifically uh, Derevka in Ukraine, which seems to have been a bit the epicenter of transformation of the use, because here there are bone objects identified by some as horse bits that have been found near the remains of a stallion dating around 4000 BC, right? Um, as early as that. But it does, this doesn't mean that um, cavalry began necessarily, in, you know, systematically at, at the time. Um, in fact, this is very hypothetical, properly even to 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 point out, since the the, the bone fragments are pierced in a way that could have been due to the most different reasons, right? Uh, and that especially would have that we know would have been forgotten by man in favor of another mean that is the nose ring, right? So the the bit. Um, essentially a more efficient system for driving a horse would have been forgotten for many centuries in favor of this more painful tool that monopolized archaeological finds for, for a couple of millennia to come, right? And this naturally doesn't mean that, you know, uh, people were dumb because they, you know, had discovered how to, you know, eventually use something more functional for horse riding and just essentially pulling horses that way. This has to do with some dynamics that are difficult to reconstruct, properly connected to those uh, communities, uh, you know, organizations and how they used the horse in the first place, or the, for which, you know, cavalry might have not been convenient yet, right? Uh, however, we have to wait up to the, the 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 middle centuries of the second millennium BC to find horse bits in the steppes of Central Asia, from the Urals to Mongolia. Thus, albeit we know that horses were ridden systematically uh, by the third millennium BC at the latest, for our purpose that that is strictly military, we have to consider what we were saying before. That is to say. Um, you know, yeah, there were horse riding, but how, you know, um, was the horse properly conceived as a military uh, mean, right, as a kind of a vehicle or a, or a war platform, right? So, because, in fact, the, even if a, a, some individual had been able to ride a horse, they would have necessarily not have the... Uh, control on the animal for in combat right uh, for war purposes in in general right so um, the horse was tamed uh, for the purpose of, of riding which can be carried out only if you have the the, the capacity of managing uh, complexly an, an entire herd right or at least a, a necessary quantity to provide sufficient mounts to a group of warriors, right? So by this time, of course, military purpose could be even using the horse as a pack animal, right? And as always for meat in general in the broader, in the broader use. So the first proven evidence of the military man-horse union is still later than that another 1,000 year, and more specifically, the tomb of Krivoe Ozero in Siberia, uh, belonging to the Andronovo culture, right, in its earliest form known as Sintashta or Petrovka, uh, dated precisely to 2026 BC, which is specifically the first known example of funeral burial with a two-wheeled chariot pulled by horses. And how do we know this was for a military purpose? Well, because the tomb um, uh, has, among the other finds, some arrowheads and spears, right? And considering also the, the, the later evolution of cavalry, what we know that was fundamentally the direction, and this is the earliest evidence we have for the, the military purpose of 
of horsemanship. Um, so for those people specifically, the horse was so important, right? Um, we're talking about around the, the second millennium BC, as you understand. Uh, so much that humans, that at that point in the area were sedentary, they would turn into nomads. This is something very interesting that is documented also in later realities. Think about the Comanches, right? That transform, you know, they were essentially a sedentary and relatively, you know, uh, peaceful people until they started essentially importing um, uh, trading you know, horses with, with, with the Spanish and they transformed themselves literally into a semi-nomadic um, imperialist and systematically aggressive violent and ruthless population because of the what they could do with cavalry and these people were uh, atrociously uh, capable equestrians at that point but that tells you how uh, you know how important such such factor is properly in for, properly from a communitarian point of view, right? And this is in fact the beginning of nomadism as we know it in the step proper, meaning um, an itinerant life, literally following the herds of animals from which they got, uh, you know, just more than the meat or or you know this other resources, but properly the capacity to wage war, right? And Scythians and Sarmatians around 1000 BC. Now, properly in the Iron Age, are the first known nomadic populations in the West that arrive properly, as you know, with that dramatic equestrian capacity. So, the question is also, however, when and where actually was the war chariot invented, right? Because th this is not to be thought that, you know, it began in the steppe where horses were first um, domesticated for, for, for that purpose, right? The chariot was perhaps invented in Mesopotamia uh, by the mid uh, fourth millennium BC, right? Uh, however, the first evidence is much later, dates back essentially to the standard of Ur of the Sumerians, very famous iconographic source, so still in Mesopotamia, dating instead to essentially one millennium later. What we see though <laughs> there, as we were saying before that horses were, you know, used for military purpose later, is actually a chariot pulled by for, uh, by, by own aggers, right, with, with four solid wheels, right, and so something, you know, naturally a bit rudimentary for the time, especially not using horses specifically. Um, and the refinement of chariotry would start instead in the aforementioned Sintashta Petrovka culture, right, that essentially developed uh, more agile platforms um, that suitable for following a flock or herd in the steppe plains, right? While more sedentary populations fundamentally kept relying just mostly on, on, on infantry and, you know, chariotry was, you know, contemplated for, you know, of course, mm, transportation means and so on, uh, connected to the to the politics of society, but uh, that need of having a sp speedy, functional, uh, in fact, efficient uh, mean of transportation for for keeping up with with with, an, with horses, right? At, with the same herds, so free horses, not other chariots, begins in the step. And so, th this had happened because essentially, our ancestors discovered that the horse is a somewhat less bizarre animal than the donkey. Um, although at the time it was actually roughly of the same size. Mm -hmm. They were, as you know, very sort of like compact animals, smaller than you know the, the later breeds that were to evolve, right? At this point, um, the Nisian horse appears by the, 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 the 5th century BC. It's, it's something um, that uh, eventually, is, you know, it was the largest thing that ever, had ever been produced in that in, in terms of breeds, and eventually, as you know, things would enlarge um, as well. So that's how early certain things are, but and as you understand, with in this moment also an improvement in breed selection occurred, and um, the for centuries, for many centuries, the, the horse, in fact, had not been sturdy enough to be ridden for long periods. Right? What we see with, with mon, you know, with, with ancient cavalry as it was developed properly at the time is that the horse is a very resilient animal. Well, that's that's artificial. It was created by man, 
right? Um, it's a very resilient animal, still very delicate, meaning that if it's crippled, something it's for no good use anymore. But originally it wasn't like that, right? That resilience was selected specifically. Uh, and therefore, cavalry mostly relied on charity uh, with a couple of animals that were enough essentially to ensure transportation for two men and their weapons, and that was fundamentally the deal. Uh, also, the horse has some other advantages by itself, um, has three gates, step, trot, and gallop, right? Donkeys <laughs> just walk, uh, basically just like men or even less, right? Uh, otherwise, they can start galloping randomly and out of control almost completely. So, as you understand, in combat, this is not, right, you know, a particularly reliable animal, right? The horse instead provided with that kind of... Um, you know, of, of reliability. And, and uh, in fact, the, 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 the horse responds to the driver's command, is much more docile properly and, and, and less stubborn, definitely, than its pack relatives. Uh, the horse was also ridden, as we've seen at the time, but given the weakness of, of the ramp, it had to be mounted on the from the rear, right? And, and the donkeys um, are still ridden today, um, practically, you know, clinging t t to the neck, right? So the horse um, also has other characteristics such as the fact that it's a fearful and delicate animal, right? There are certain situations also in war where, you know, you have really to select certain specific, mm, um, let's say, horses because of their mindset. Not ho all horses, for example, charge straight into the enemy. There are some, you know, stop in front of, I don't know, they don't walk over corpses or things like that. So, in, in combat, you need to 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 select some of the most aggressive um, um, elements. You have to train them and so on. Also, uh, the horse is subject to many ailments. Like it, it cannot vomit, for example, uh, and its uh, short intestine forces it to eat three times a day, which also logistically has to be considered. Um, however, it has an important advantage that is um, the having such an being such an efficient mean of transportation, right? By itself was an, a sufficient motivation to overcome any of these difficulties. So the horse was developed, having seen that it was capable of sustaining such thing, um, not just as you know to, as a more resilient animal for transportation, but properly as a weapon of war, right? So. Translating the advantage that the shepherd had over the herd, um, uh, and that he guarded to the conflict between peoples, and this is not really a few because essentially most of our um, history, uh, up to the full sedentarization essentially of of the Eurasian continent, did pass largely through these waves of pastoral nom nomadic peoples that periodically invaded basic the, the south with, with, with a dramatic military quality that was uh, properly at some point superior in, 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 in properly in its concentration over the ones of sanitary military systems that eventually had a much greater political and social absorption capacity so that most of what we see, for example, in terms of the Indo-European migrations is quite eloquent because there, there is properly a will of power, if you want uh, to use niche in terms, um, to, that, that would manage to, to properly, to ideologically uh, transform right, the, the local cultures, but still with a sustratum that belonged overwhelmingly, you know, the majority to to other peoples, to other ideas, to other cults. So it's a deep anthropological connection that properly between horse and man that from these religions that eventually originated from the steps of mostly celestial oriented, military oriented, in which the horse had this centrality eventually spread in the rest of the world. And we are basically the children of, of, of this, whether, uh, you know, I can't say we will like it or not because, you know, I don't see what would be the problem, but uh, in any in either ways, but that properly uh, still affect us in ways that we, you know, if if you read this chronologically, you know, you, you can see it as a straight line, right? And what people today completely ignore about this dynamic is instead what mostly lays at the foundation of our uh, 
of our culture. Uh, in the West, this is particularly evident because we were somewhat more exposed um, to such waves. In part, in fact, the same in the European world, these languages, it's you know, they are fundamentally their roots in such uh, in such past, and um, it yeah it, it started if you want through this because otherwise the steps would have not had quite of a different mean of uh, you know of expansion that the, their military their equestrian military instruments that provided them right? and changing a lot of things properly from from a cultural point of view from uh, from from the very steps right compared to to previous history and i realize we we don't we don't tell such early history most of the times but it, we really should take a look at that in that perspective so essentially chariot warfare was thus born right so and a bit by conquest and a bit by emulation from central siberia the chariot initially spread throughout the steppe where you know it, it could find um it happened seemingly more, more or less the same times right you know up to the borders of the taiga in the north and iran in the south um and uh, because here the the conditions were more perfectus right the, that development as we were saying before seems to have been relatively homogeneous the steps have always been somewhat interconnected and the the essentials were fundamentally the same. So um, from 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 the steppe, the chariot spread around the first half of the second millennium into China, uh, in the east, Central Europe, and the Balkans to the west, Asia Minor, and Egypt to the south. Right, um, and this naturally tells you how much contact existed already. Um, millennia before Christ between peoples altogether right they weren't just invaded they, they were they were trading they were in contact they were importing uh, horses they were and and this speaks for the success of cavalry that otherwise as we've seen for millennia had hadn't quite seemed to be much of an opportunity but properly the the preconditions of these communities hadn't been um, satisfactory for its development up to that point um, the Mitanni in northern Syria were the first in this era um, to earn the reputation of uh, skilled warriors on chariots right? by writing the first manual on their training mm -hmm. and uh, which came to use in, in a Hittite version together with the Ixos group from an intimately still nomadic and merchant population infiltrated Egypt until they became its rulers for over a century essentially 1674 1548 uh, and incidentally the Ixos are also said to be the inventors of another weapon which would be somewhat characteristic of the uh, of, of, of Eastern cultures that remain deeply permeated with nomadic culture for for millennia to come that is the composite bow Right, that which made it possible um, to use um, uh, from to, to shoot essentially from the platform of the chariot to hit enemies from an even greater distance. Naturally, this would spread also pretty much among the rest of the cavalry and infantry later on. So, the invention of the horse brought um, in 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 the art of war uh, a, a very uh, current uh, tactical principle uh, that uh, up to that point had never quite been developed at least that much that is that that is the one of mobility and maneuver that is to say the man who first understood the importance of of maneuver would have actually not have many problems to understand concepts such as the one of the blitzkrieg or airland battle or shock and L right and um, so cavalry opened to this more uh, you know dynamic employment of, of the arms right with a shock power that had previously been uh, unconceivable but also w with a speed and, and therefore a maneuvering capacity that uh, had been unknown up to that time
and you you can argue that 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 uh, that injection, let's say, in the art of war, never finished, right? Never ran out of steam because even if today we don't quite use much of horses anymore, but tanks, helicopters, airplanes, and tomorrow spaceships will be nothing essentially more than uh, super horses, right? Maybe less beautiful or elegant. Nevertheless, the the same concept that uh, humans, you know, began to to master at this point with with a, a much more aggressive culture than uh, properly so in in the the, the shock element, the, the the use of of impact, of enveloping, of surrounding, etc. Um, in a um, and way that the chariot naturally presented it by itself uh, in ways that were brought down just by uh, further development of infantries that in part corresponded to, to if you want to, to say, uh, fa properly an anti-cavalry need, uh, naturally reflecting a broader context even in there that is not just about the arms but the, the communities that provided that, that force. And that paradoxically spread the importance of cavalry further because f throughout all the ancient world cavalry would have not been um, in, in some contexts, aside from, from nomadic ones, but speaking in, sed in the sanitary world, cavalry would have had a, an important centrality, um, if not a preeminence in certain specific contexts. But generally speaking, you know, it was infantry who was to remain up to the Middle Ages the, the strongest arm, right? But uh, chariots in that regard had proven to be less maneuverable, less efficient than cavalry in, in itself. Right, considered that when chariots came about, uh, infantry essentially couldn't quite cope with uh, with this with this um, sudden, uh, fast, um, unreachable threat. Right, they were exposed. But that part of the reason why the composite bow was developed is properly pinning down the the infantry, right, to block it, to surround it, to harass it from different sides, and you know how psychologically devastating it is to be outflanked and uh, surrounded and so on. Um, and the, uh, the the decline of chariot warfare, however, paved the road for the development of cavalry in as uh, we intended modernly. Uh, that was, uh, a, a, if you want, a more sophisticated mean at that point, based on collective, much greater collective training that, than horsemen have ever had at that point to essentially infiltrate or to. I mean, they're always outflanking or attacking from from the rear. Um, in, you know, essentially those spaces that were not filled by infantry and um, that could disregard more years more surgically and more, uh, more, uh, say with more agility properly than than chariots that they, albeit having an important maneuverability and skill and so on, were were not as as strong as cavalry, and especially such a, a compact mass. Right, chariots need also some space between one another. There is uh, a different um, compactness, properly, of the formations, um, uh, resistance, and cohesion uh, regarding the two, which increased significantly. And and cavalry, as the the hammer, right, had made stronger on the anvil. We we we, we can say, and so the development of cavalry started, as we were saying before, mostly. You know, as a as a prevalent mounted arm uh, over chariotry from essentially the Iron Age, but it, it already existed. There is, it was mo originally mostly um, an aristocratic uh, requirement in a way that had always been for many reasons that have to do both with the fact that the conquerors of the steppe, so those who brought uh, cavalry in in uh, you know around, uh, spread spread it properly as a not just as a military, but a political and social model, were great leaders of, in fact, of, of, of peoples, shepherds of peoples, not just of horses or animals, right? So the idea of a superiority based on certain um, moral values corresponding to equestrian capacities as well is at the root of, of chivalry, right? That's what it was fundamentally born um, in um, in some ways, it probably it existed also among infantry, but it 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 wasn't uh, let's say uh, 
uh, it wasn't so marked as what you can achieve properly over, especially over other peoples that are in sets much more numerous. You see, there is an el elitary uh, um, uh, value properly in, in cavalry and dominating over these sedentary populations that were case of Europe also subjugated as you understand it was properly an idea of fighting the, the, the few winning over the many and so uh, a, a, a very in a way also individualistic ideal by certain standards that is you know this necessity of the leader to, to be somewhat someone loader loaded with um, with specific qualities uh, and uh, ruling over masses that had been proven in fear to prevent through their defeat and this was deeply, it wasn't much about the horse in itself, but the moral forces that lay properly at, at the root of this process, also the, the much greater pressure that the steps posed properly in the, uh, to the, the, the single individual uh, down the, the, you know, the, the, in the hierarchy, in the step, compared to the, the more relatively, more, let's say, more mm, stable, uh, sedentary civilizations, at least at, at the base of of, of society and their uh, their productive um, uh, classes. So also in the sedentary world, this model model would have been imitated and developed further, so that you know a good leader had to, to know how to properly. Also, with the same advantage naturally that the the horse offers, technically speaking, to a leader. If this, if anything, his elevation above ground is speed uh, the capacity properly of managing a situation tactically speaking that you know as, as an infantryman you you, you are more in difficult uh, to, to to perform um, and uh, so this would prevail as the the, the infantry themselves would have toughened up and uh, it was more the, the charity in itself as a very expensive tool could not um, uh, essentially uh, go on very much longer but that would have been supplanted by a more intensive um, use of the of the of the horse uh, of this of the horse riding arm all right, for today we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.